go. All right. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Today is January 26th, and we are continuing on in our look at the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. uh, chapter 11. Well, starting in chapter 11, we're going to go through chapters 11 through 15 this week, hopefully, get all those covered. But... Uh, <clears throat> Okay. We're just kind of hitting the high points, you That's know. Good. It's not we're not going through all the genealogy and every little thing that goes on there, but uh, try to hit the high points, the important things, and uh, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of what's going on in the world today, you know. The very well, this whole world itself, the creation yeah. we learned about in Genesis. This is how it all started, and how. Uh, so many different things are the way they are, and we're going to start off right here in chapter 11, finding okay. out why there's so many different languages and different uh, people that? groups in the world. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's just start off there. Okay. It says, um, we'll read the and first the few verses world. there. The whole world had one language and a common speech. Yeah. The people moved eastward. They found a plain in Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone, mm -hmm. tar for mortar. And then they mm -hmm. said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name. And the word, uh, word name there talks about a reputation. Make a reputation for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So it's like, instead of God telling them to go and multiply and, uh -huh. and you know, populate the earth, they're going to stay in this one spot. Uh-huh. And they were talking about making a name for themselves. Yeah. There, there's no mention of God there. It's like, we want to do this ourselves. Yes, but it's, God said. Well, we'll get into what God said, but... <laughs> No, I mean but what, before that. <laughs> well, yeah, God had said, go into all the all earth the and, and multiply and, right. and occupy it. Yeah. But uh, they wanted to stay together, and uh, it was like um, God was excluded from all of this. You know, we don't need God. If we can just stay together, uh -huh. we all speak the uh -huh. same thing. And definitely, there's power in all speaking the same thing. We read later on that as Christians, we are to speak the same thing. Uh -huh. Doesn't mean the same language, but just we're to speak the same thing about God. And uh, yeah, there's power in agreement. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's power in agreement for wickedness too, for wrong thinking, wrongdoing. That's an and, interesting uh, thought. Yeah, but that's true though. There's power in agreement both for negative and for positive. And we should, as Christians, be speaking the same thing, you know, in the sense of that we're all uh, children of God and that we're all uh, working towards, you know, establishing or pro proclaiming the name of Jesus and proclaiming the gospel. But their purpose in speaking the same thing and, and being united was mm -hmm. to make a reputation yeah. for themselves yeah. as humans. Yeah. And God came down, and it says, um, verse uh, 5 says, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, if, if as one people, speaking the same language, they begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. So he says, come, let us go down and confuse their language. Again, we see the plural here used of, of God. Yeah, that's it. Talking about the Trinity. Okay. Let's confuse their language so they'll not be able to understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. And that's why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. Hmm. And then from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole world. So I guess they called it Babel because they all... To, to each other, they sound like they were just babbling. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden you're standing by your 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 buddy and he's speaking some language you don't understand anymore. It's so, kind of like husbands and wives. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I that's never true. can understand women. <laughs> well, <laughs> we have but the same in problem. this case, it was because it was a totally different language. 
uh, you know, he's speaking, you know, I don't know what the original language was. I'm sure it wasn't English, but whatever. But say you're, you're talking to your best buddy and you've been talking in English and all of a sudden he's talking in some language you don't understand yeah. anymore. And we switched and, over to Arabic. Or... Yeah, and it's like, uh, how, you, how do you <laughs> do anything when everybody's speaking a different language? Yeah. You can't understand each other. And so they all scatter, you know. You're crazy. I don't understand you anymore. You're the one that's crazy. I don't understand you. <laughs> of course, they didn't even know they were telling each other they were crazy because they couldn't understand each other. Almost comical, but uh, it, to, to God, it was a serious thing that they were doing. They were trying to build a reputation and a name for themselves, not for God. And they were trying to accomplish things outside of God. You might say this is a, uh, an early example of, uh, of human secular, secularism, you know, where it's all about man. You know, man's their own God, and, and we don't need God. We just, uh, we just do what we want to do. Oh. And that is not a good, not not a good, good place thing. to be, no. Gets you into trouble. Then we go into a, a, the rest of chapter 11 is talking about the, uh, the lineage of Shem who was, of course, one of the sons of Noah, as we talked about uh, last week. And we find out that out of Shem was, uh, well, first of all, Abraham. And, of course, mm -hmm. out of Abraham come the, the nation of Israel. So Shem was, the, you might say, was the father of the, of the Israelites. But it goes down, and we won't go all through the genealogy, but till we come down to a man by the name of Terah. And in verse 30, or 27, it says, this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah okay. became the father of Abram. Abram. Of course, we know that la later became Abraham, but this is, uh, at this time, his name is called Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Mm -hmm. Haran became the father of Lot. We need to know that because we see Lot here a little bit later. Mm -hmm. He was, of course, it would be Abraham's nephew since he was the son of his brother. While his father, Terah, was still alive, Haran died in the Ur of the Chaldees. So this probably explains why Lot traveled with Abraham, because his father had already died. Abraham and Nahor uh, both married. The name of Abram's, the Abram, I keep saying Abraham, but it's still called Abram. The man, yeah. name of Abram's wife was Sarai. Yeah. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Ishka. Mm -hmm. Now, Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive. So we see right now that Sarah apparently was barren. She was not able to conceive any children. Terah took his son Abraham, Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from the Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Now, the Ur of the Chaldees is uh, down south, about 150 miles south of what uh, is the ancient city of Babylon, where the Tower of Babel was being built. And Haran is uh, quite a ways north of there. But actually, it's interesting because Canaan, where he said they were headed, was <clears throat> directly west, or almost directly west of Ur. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, why would they go way up north to Haran to go to Canaan? Well, if you look at the geography of that country, and I was just looking on a, an old map, um, the area between Ur and Canaan was almost all desert. Whereas if you went up straight north, you followed the rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. You could go up north to a certain point and then you kind of veer off uh, going southwest and you come down to Canaan. And so it's almost like to go from Ur to Canaan, instead of going a straight line, you would go like a V. You'd go up north for quite a ways and then you'd turn and go down south, southwest. And so that's how apparently they wound up in the city called Haran. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Terah, the father of Abram, uh, died there in Haran. And in, verse, in chapter 12, it talks about God uh, speaking to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And he says, I want you to uh, 
to leave your country and your people and your father's household to the land I'll show you. And uh, we'll find out in a little bit, of course, that is the land of Canaan. In other words, God said, I want you to finish this journey. You started this journey to Canaan, but somehow or another you got sidetracked and you settled down in Haran. Yeah. But he also makes his promise to Abraham. He says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. Yeah. I, will make, I will make your name great. Now, before we, the people were talking about, they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to make the, uh, them, for themselves a great name. Here God says, I'll make your name he great. Does it, yeah, yes. God's the one that does it, not, not yeah. ourselves. He's the one that does when we it set out it. to make a great name for ourselves, we may be able to do it in, in the sense of, of the world, you know, mm -hmm. gain fame, fortune, whatever, but unless God makes your name great, uh, it's it's really not going to last. It's not it's not worth that much. He says, "I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, mm -hmm. and whoever curses you, I will I'm curse. Gracious. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you." Now, how was it that all the people on earth would be blessed through him? Well, Abraham was the father of the Israelites, the father of the Jews. And who came out of the nation of Israel? Jesus. Of course, Jesus, yeah. And of course, the whole earth is blessed because him. Because of him. Or at yeah. least it can be blessed if they would accept him. <laughs> uh, Hopefully you have. Unfortunately, you know, not everybody will, but there's that opportunity for the whole world yeah. to be blessed because of his seed. And later on in the New Testament, it talks about that. It was through the seed of Abraham. And it doesn't, it says not seeds like plural, but seed singular, which is, of course, Jesus. So Abraham leaves Haran. He's already 75 years old. It says Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all that they owned, and uh, they headed out for Canaan. Uh, they, uh, Spent some time there, and God's uh, the Lord appeared to Abraham again. Down in verse 7, it says, To your offspring I'll give this land. And so he built an altar there. And uh, God blessed him during that time. But there did come a famine on the land. Down in verse 10, it talks about a famine in the land. And now I just, <clears throat> as we read this story, it, it just shows us that, that we're all human beings. We all have our faults. So here's Abram, a man that God is, says he's going to bless, going to make a great nation out of him. But when the famine came, the first thing he did was go to Egypt. Now, I don't see anywhere in here where God told him to go to Egypt. God told him, I want you to go to down to Canaan. Uh -huh. But during the famine, I guess... Abraham got a little nervous, so he up and went to, to Egypt. But the worst part of it is, <clears throat> it says in verse 11, as they were about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Oh, when the Egyptians yeah. see you, they'll say, this is his wife. Then they'll kill me, but we'll let you live. Mm -hmm. Say you're my sister so that I'll be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. So he, he's got some... <clears throat> fear issues, let's say, and some yeah, concerns let's there. Just say that. I mean, you're yeah. a beautiful woman, man. When all these, yeah. I mean, these are ungodly heathen over here. When they see you, see how pretty, how beautiful you are. Why they're just going to kill me and take you to be one of their wives? And <clears throat> and actually, what happened was something pretty much like that. It says when the Pharaoh's officials <clears throat> saw her, they uh, praised. <clears throat> excuse me. They praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace, into his harem. Uh -huh. so. And Abraham let it happen. He let his wife be taken into Pharaoh's uh, harem. Uh, now, he treated Abraham well, it says, uh, verse 16, that Pharaoh treated him well. He gave him cattle and sheep, donkeys and servants, camels. But he took his wife, and he never says a word. Well, maybe he's trying to protect himself. Well, yeah, he is trying to protect himself, but he's not trusting in God. I mean, again, that just goes to show you that 
God uses imperfect people. Yeah. You know, Abraham, in, in, uh, over Romans 4, it talks about Abraham being the father of our faith, but Abraham had problems too. Yeah. Abraham, you know, was, was fearful, and he allowed his wife to be taken. Now, whether, you know, whether... Sarai was compromised during this time. We don't know that. It's very possible that she was. Know that she wasn't. And uh, but anyway, <clears throat> it said, "But the Lord, you know, the Lord intervenes. Sometimes uh -huh. the Lord intervenes, even when we do dumb things." Yeah. And to me, this was pretty dumb. Thank God, he this does. was pretty dumb. He was willing to sacrifice his wife to to adultery uh, just so he they wouldn't kill him. It said, but the Lord, in verse 17, inflicted serious disease on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. He said, what have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Uh -huh. Now, how he found out, I don't know. Whether God spoke to him. Uh, or Sarah you know, did. Yeah, maybe Sarah did. Finally, finally Sarah said, look, I'm more than his <laughs> really sister. I'm his like wife. That. But uh, we find in a few chapters on, he does the same thing in another time with Abimelech. And God does speak to Abimelech in that case. So maybe he spoke to Pharaoh too and said, look, this woman you've, you're taking is married. <clears throat> and this is why you're having so many problems. Why all you people are, why all your relatives are sick? Because you've taken this man's wife and this man is, is, under, my, is under my protection. Now, under God's protection. And anyway, however he found out, he did find out. And of course, mm -hmm. he's very upset with Abraham. He gives his wife back and he says, take her and get out of here. Yeah, yeah. He didn't want any curse coming on, his, <clears throat> on him. Or He'd his already had enough curse, yeah. yeah. And so anyway, they went on their way. Uh, they left Egypt, went back to Canaan, the land of Canaan, mm -hmm. which, you know, eventually was the promised land. And said they went to the Negev. And uh, they went, you know, it's he and his wife and Lot. Apparently Lot followed them into Egypt. And now they're following them back out to, to they're going back out to Canaan. Uh, it's interesting that you went to the Negev. Well, the Negev today is just, it's desert. I mean, it's a wilderness out there. Okay. But apparently at this time it was not because they had all this livestock, uh, both Abraham and Lot. Lot. In fact, his. in verse uh, 2, it says Abram had become very wealthy in uh -huh. livestock and in silver and gold. And the Negev, they went from place to place till they came to Bethel. Uh, it was a place where he had earlier built an altar and there he called on the name of the Lord. Uh -huh. uh, but they come into some problems here because both of them by this time were rich in, in herds and flocks. Verse, uh -huh. uh, verse 5 of chapter 13, it says, Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had fl fl flocks and herds. So they actually and outgrew kids. the land. Yeah, but the land so could not were... support them while they stayed together, mm -hmm. for their possessions were so great. And they got to be some quarreling between the herdsmen, you know. And uh -huh. uh, this is my pasture. No, this is we were here first. You got to get out of here. You know, we they, we want this pasture. And anyway, there was some difficulties there. So finally, Abram said to Lot, "Look, let's let's not have any quarreling. You know, we're we're relatives. We're related. So let's uh, you know not have any fussing, fighting here. Uh, <laughs> we got this whole land and before us. So." You decide which way you want to go. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, then I'll go to the left, whatever. And uh, so Abe Lot looked around, and, and he saw the land that looked the best. And this was around Sodom and Gomorrah. The, the land that says it was like uh, uh, almost like Eden, the Garden of Eden. And so he decided, oh, I like this. First of all, it's a very fertile plain. and. Yeah. And another thing, it's it's near big cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, these, these big cities, you know. So if we want to take my wife shopping, well, I can go right into the big city, you know, and go to Macy's or somewhere. <laughs> so he has his eyes on things. <clears throat> yeah, on yeah, on things, on the fertility of the land, uh -huh. on the fact, I think, too, that like yeah. I say, there's the big cities nearby. 
And so he chooses what looks like the best to him. Yeah. He's and going by what he sees. Sometimes what we think is the best is not always near, or not always the, what is the best. And it says, uh, uh, the two men parted company, and, and verse 12, Abram lived in the land of uh -huh. Canaan, while Lot lived near the cities mm -hmm. of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Mm -hmm. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the they Lord. Were so again, this is in an area that, Nowadays, it's just pretty desolate down near the Dead Sea. But apparently at this time, it was a very fertile land. But of course, we know what happened, and we'll find out here in a few chapters what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And apparently that changed the whole uh, geography, topography, whatever you want to call it, of that land. And because it went from being a fertile uh, area to being pretty desolate. Yeah. But the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had departed from him, look around mm -hmm. from where you are, to the north, to south, east, west, all this land I'm going to give to you and your offspring forever. Well, now, I'm sure Abram was thinking, my offspring? I don't have any kids. I mean, <laughs> Sarah's not able to conceive. Not yet, anyway. And yet he says, God says this, I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that yeah. If anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So, again, he's reiterating his promises. He's reinforcing it. Abram is still having some problems, you know, accepting all of this and, and uh, believing it all, trusting God completely, but his, his faith is growing over this. Yeah. We go into chapter 14, and we won't go into a lot of detail on that, but uh, Abraham, I mean, a lot was living near the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a war that go on, or a uh -huh. war that went on, rebellion, and, and uh, eventually wound up with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah being captured along with them, Lot and all his family, and everything was captured. Well, Abraham heard about it, and he took up his trained men and went after him and uh, yeah, defeated them and rescued. recovered, yeah, recovered Lot, recovered the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and uh, uh -huh. as they were coming back, uh, first of all, they met uh, uh, the king of Sodom and he offered uh, uh, the... Uh, all the goods to Abram. He said, you know, I'll give you, you know, you give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But he said, I have sworn an oath to the Lord. I'm not going to accept anything from you. Um, I don't want you to be able to say I made Abr Abram rich. Uh -huh. So he's trusting in God here. But also right before that, he also met another man. It's a interesting um Huh? Interesting conversation or interesting uh, meeting here. It says in verse 18 of chapter 14, it says, Then Melchizedek, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out wine and bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed Abraham by saying, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hands. And... Uh, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. He tithed to this Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek, that name means king of righteousness. And he's also called uh, king of Salem, which means king of peace. Which is Jerusalem. Salem is Jerusalem. Yeah, Jerusalem, yeah. yeah. Uh, we see him mentioned only two other times. In, in Psalms 110, verse, yeah. 14, or verse 4, it talks about being a priest forever after the uh, the uh, order of Melchizedek, uh -huh. and then in Hebrews chapter in seven, Hebrews, most yeah. of that chapter is devote talks about Melchizedek, Jesus being mm -hmm. a, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, yeah. and it, uh, there's there's a couple of different thoughts there. One, of course, is that Melchizedek was like a type of Jesus, mm -hmm. says he was without father and mother. Well, it just means. That could just mean the fact there's no genealogy of them recorded here. Most of the important people in the Old Testament, there's there's a genealogy. It tells who their parents were, their lineage. Well, there's no mention of where Melchizedek came from. It says that 
he, he remained a priest forever. Well, it just means, it could just mean that there's no mention of his birth, there's no mention of his death. The other thought is that Melchizedek was actually a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. There's several places in the, in the Old Testament where they feel that, that it was, uh, where it talks about uh, a man appearing that, well, even when uh, Lot had the uh, argument with God, you know, over saving Sodom and Gomorrah, if he could find 40 righteous people or 30 righteous, it talks about that being the Lord in, in human form. And so it's like this is a, a Jesus appearing in human form before he came to earth actually as a human. There's some people that feel that that's yeah. who Melchizedek was. Well, we don't know for don't sure. He could have, yeah. he could have, those are the two most likely possibilities here. He just a, a foreshadowing uh, of Jesus, kind of a, a seeing uh, a man that was kind of like, well, Moses, you know, was talked about as being a foreshadowing of Jesus, you know, leading people out of their sin, out of Egypt, out of the land of captivity. And so Melchizedek could have just been a foreshadowing of Jesus, or he could have been just a pre-appearance of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But, but whatever. The interesting thing about that is this is where Abraham uh, tithes. This is the first yes, well, that's of yeah. tithe. And that's also mentioned in uh, Hebrews. It talks about, yeah. uh, you know, in, in, uh, with among the Jews, the tithe was paid to the, to the Levites. The Levites mm -hmm. were the ones who were accepting tithes. Well, yeah. in this case, it was like the Levites giving the tithe to Melchizedek because even though there wasn't the tribe of Levi at the no, time, and in wasn't. essence, they were in the loins of Abraham, you might yeah. say. That's what it talks about in Hebrews, that the Levites were still in the, in the loins of Abraham. And they hadn't been says, born yet. As, uh, you know, the, the greater uh, is always blessed by the lesser. So in, in this other words, it's saying mm -hmm. that Melchizedek was, was greater than Abraham. And uh, that's also, yeah, very interesting that he begins, establishes a tie there, at least right there. shows a tithe. Uh, that he gave the tithe uh, of to everything. Melchizedek, yeah, of everything that he had he had captured, and and Abraham Abraham was a wealthy man. Yeah, and he'd recovered a lot I mean, of he'd recovered a lot of stuff too in his battle because you know they had taken stuff from Lot from the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, several yeah. cities there. So they'd probably ransacked these cities and. Probably a great deal of wealth that uh, that he so had this there. This is a huge and he gave him a tip amount that, that he's yeah. giving Melchizedek. Yeah. I think that's interesting. But yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> so, but, you think God wants the church poor? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. <laughs> he sure doesn't you know? want our pastor to be poor. <laughs> well, God wants to bless us. He does. You know, that doesn't mean he expects all of us to be millionaires, but he no. expects all of us to be uh, able to meet our needs and, and have plenty to, to give to others, as, you know, it talks about in yeah. 2 Corinthians 9. That's you know, right. He that blesses have, his people so that his people can give. Can be a blessing, yeah. yeah. And that's basically what he was telling Abraham back in that, when he first talked to him. That's that, right. I'm going to make you a blessing so you can bless others. Right. He doesn't make us a blessing just for our own benefit, just so we can, we can, you know, have a nice life and forget about everybody else. Uh -huh. He created us to be channels to 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 give through us, to yeah. give to us, so we can give to others. Yes. And really, is the more God gives us, it's it's instead of uh, this thing of strictly as a blessing for us, we have to think of it as a test too. God's blessed me with all this. What am I going to do with it? Uh -huh. Am I just going to heap it up on myself and just, you know, so I have more so, you know, I can have a nice retirement and travel and do all kinds of good things. And, and again, God's I'm not saying God's against those things, but is that our whole purpose in life? Is that whatever, you know, is that all we think about is what, what good is it going to do me? But when God blesses us, do we think, 
How can I bless others? God has blessed me so richly, so abundantly. How can I bless others? Who can I help? And, you know, and I believe, first of all, we need to think of the church, and we need to be tithing and giving to the church so that the gospel can go forward. Mm -hmm. But then even beyond that, there's, you know, if we know of people that need help, we, we need to be generous. We need to help where we can. And, and God blesses. God blesses generosity. God yes, is a generous does. God. I talked about that back when we were uh, talking about creation. When you look at the, at the, the, the uh, variety of things that God has put in this earth. I mean, he could have made this earth a boring place. He could have made it black and white. And as I was telling somebody one time, and God could have made, you know, like the only kind of food there was was Brussels sprouts and oatmeal, you know. Oh you had to live the whole life on Brussels sprouts and oatmeal. <laughs> But God made such a variety of stuff that we can consume and yeah. enjoy. And, and again, God gave us those things to enjoy, but not to heap upon ourselves and just to keep it to ourselves and say, oh, you know, this is mine and I'm not going to share it with anybody. <laughs> you know, there was a, a farmer, Jesus, Jesus at least told a parable about a farmer that got that way. He, had huge harvests and so many crops. He didn't know what to do. He said, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns. I'll store it all up. And then yeah. I can eat, drink, and be merry. And uh -huh. God said, you fool. Yeah. You know, tonight your life is going to be required of you. And then who gets all this stuff? <laughs> you worked all your life for this. And, and once you die, it's just, it's just no longer does you any good. But as somebody said, you know, you can send it on ahead uh -huh, uh -huh. by giving to others. You know, it says you're building treasure in heaven for yourself. You know, Solomon uh, talked about that in the book of Ecclesiastes. If we ever get there, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. He's talking about all these things that he's done and uh -huh. all the wealth he's had. And he says, yeah. it's all vanity. <laughs> it's all vanity. <laughs> all vanity. <laughs> Wasted time. And winds up with, a, you know, the only thing, the only uh purpose of man is to serve god and do, yeah, good. And do good and that's that's the whole that's, that's what it all boils down to <laughs> serve god you know you can serve yourself all your life but once this life's over then what good is it but if you serving god and giving and being generous and in and essence you're building people. you're building up rewards you're building up things for that are going to last yeah. forever you know, you can build great monuments that may last for hundreds of years. You know, people have built, well, like the pyramids that have lasted thousands of years. But someday those are going to be gone. You know, no matter how great the monuments you build to yourself or to your country or whatever, someday those are going to be gone. Yeah. But the things that we do for God, those things are eternal. When we give to God, when we uh, just help people in the name of the lord why those things are things that are eternal they don't they don't ever cease to exist all right well let's get back to genesis we kind of okay. well it, it's, it all fits it's all, in here yes, but uh, yeah but anyway god comes again to, in verse 50 or chapter 15 god comes again to abram and and Gives him another, you know, uh, assurance. Verse, uh, well, first verse there. After uh -huh. this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your great reward. Most, I mean, Abraham, Abram, he's still struggling. Lord, uh -huh. what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. You've given me no children. So, so a servant that, in my household will be my heir. So that so, was one thing that he was afraid of, that he didn't have any that offspring. That he didn't have any offspring, yeah. He was still struggling with this, even though God had already told him, yeah. I'm going to make you, you know, your offspring are going to be like the dust of the earth. And yet he's still struggling. But I don't have any children. And, well, we saw earlier he was already 75, and this a few years later, so he's probably at least in his 80s now. And, Sarah's not been able to conceive, and, nope. and uh, they got no children. And uh, 
But the Lord, in verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a servant, I mean son, son. I'm sorry, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Yes. And he took him outside and he said, Look up at the sky, Again. count the stars, if indeed you can count them. You know, that's an impossibility. You can't count them. But he says, if you could count them, then that's the way your offspring will be. And Abraham or Abram believed the Lord and it was he credited to him as righteousness. All right. So he finally is beginning to believe. to believe. And he counts that believing, that faith as righteousness. Uh -huh. And this is the first, you might say, the first reference to the fact that our righteousness comes by faith. Yes. And not then in by Romans uh, four. Right, they talked about the same thing about, about same Abraham. Thing. Yeah, believing God and it counted, count, being counted to him as righteousness. Uh -huh. So it started. And so, here. <clears throat> God counts our faith as as a, that's what counts as our righteousness. You know, in in Second uh, Corinthians five, uh, was it twenty one says that that he that knew no sin, speaking about Jesus, he that knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. It How means, do we become that? By our hard works? No, by our faith. And, and by righteousness believing in Jesus. boils actually down to pleasing God. Yeah, being in right standing with being God. Being in right standing being with him. All, being at one Doing with him. what he says. Yeah. And, you know, just... And even our giving, you know, we're talking God. about giving. It's not our giving that that counts as our righteousness, it's our faith. Mm -hmm. But that still doesn't mean, you know, that we can be uh, stingy. If we, if we are the righteousness of God, then we need to act like that righteousness. And being uh, righteous means, basically, we act like God acts. And what does God do? He's God right is a generous God. giver. God is generous in all that he does. <clears throat> Anyway, go, God goes on and says, I am the Lord who's brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to take possession of it. Um, again, Abram is questioning God. Lord, how can I know I'll gain possession of it? And so God tells him to go and bring a goat and a ram and, and a dove and a pigeon, and he cuts them up and arranges them. And, and normally this was uh, had to do with... Uh, might say cutting a covenant. Um, oh, what's the term I'm trying to use? Anyway, to establish a covenant that you lay these things out and you walk between them and, and whatnot. But it says instead that he put uh, Abram into a deep sleep and, and actually the God, the God walked among these uh, sacrifices. So basically God saying, I'm establishing it myself. It's by me that I am establishing. We again we see that over in Hebrews. It by when when there was nothing greater to swear by, he swore by himself. So God's the one that's established this covenant. It's not based on Abraham being true in everything uh -huh. he does, Abraham being faithful in everything he's doing, but it all rests on God. And of course, God is always faithful. God is always true. And so he establishes this covenant with him that he's going to give him this land. Verse, uh, where are we at? Verse 18, the last part of that says, to your descendants I give this land, yeah. from the wadi of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates, and lists all these different uh, nations that they're going to conquer, the land of the Canaanites, Canaanites, all those anyway, we won't read Canaanites, all that, but, uh, but all that land, he says, Rabbites, I'm going to give you. Amorites, and God has, has promised him this several times, that through Rabbites. you is going to be a great, great nation, that your children, your offspring are going to be like the stars of the sky, like the dust of the ground. They will be so numerous. And again, Abraham, Abram, as he's called there, he's change later to Abraham but anyway uh, he has his struggles you know a couple different times he he uh, lies about Sarah being his wife you know says she's just my sister because he's afraid of being killed you know in the next chapter and we'll get into this 
next week, but uh, they even try to raise up a son through Hagar, Hagar. through uh, Ab uh, through Sarai's yeah. uh, handmaid. You know, they try to do it by the flesh, you might say. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but God says, no, that's not the way I'm going to do it. I told you I'm going to do it this way, and I'm going to do it this way. <laughs> God does not have a plan B. <laughs> it's only plan A. And plan A is Abraham, you, and Sarah are going to have a son. But yeah. Lord, we're old. Sarah's already menopausal. You know this. Uh, how can that be? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that God has promised in his word. And I look at it and I think, how can that be? It's uh, impossible. But with God, nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible. As we're going to find out here in the next few chapters, that what God promises, He delivers. That's right. God is not a man that He should lie. And so when He says it, as far as He's concerned, it's done. It's a done deal. It may not happen for a long time. I mean, He made a promise way back in the very beginning when Adam and Eve sinned. He said that, you know, there's going to become your seed that's going to crush the head of Satan. Yeah. Well, it was. Several thousand years later before it happened, but God said, the Lamb talks about the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth. Well, we know Jesus wasn't slain from the found, wasn't actually physically slain from the foundation of the earth, but we know that as far as God was concerned, he, he was. was done. Yeah. So when God spoke it, that, you know, he was going to crush Satan's head, then it uh -huh. was done. Uh -huh. It was done. You know, God's. Time is no big deal with God. He's got all the time in the universe. He's got eternity. And he's a very patient God. You know, we, when we uh, get a promise from God, we want it right now, you know. Yeah, or God, you, yeah I want it this week, you know. But God, he doesn't, you know, he's, he's patient. In fact, it says that in, uh, was it, First Peter, where he talks about why you know, people uh -huh. say, well, why are things still the same? You know, you talk about the Lord coming back again, but things are still the same as they've been for 2,000 years. And says, God's patient. He just doesn't, he doesn't want anybody to perish. <laughs> and so he's just taking his time. He's just waiting for get as many as he can into the kingdom of God. I mean, he's not anxious sitting up there sweating, you know, worrying, you know, when, when, when when's the right time to send Jesus back? He He'll know when it's the right time. And he's just very patiently waiting. Well, Abraham, I'm sure, was getting pretty anxious. Lord, I'm getting pretty old. I'm an old man, you know, not <laughs> functioning too good anymore. And hey, Sarah, she's an old woman already. And God, when's this going to happen? You know, let's let's get things going here. God <laughs> says, yeah, just, just wait. Yeah, It'll happen. Wait. And sure enough, it did. All right. Well, enough of that for today. Uh, next week, we're going to cha cover chapter 16 and 17. So oh, just you wanna, two? Yeah, just two chapters this next week. Oh. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll go through those two. Okay. But, so that'll give you a chance. Just really encourage you to read those ahead of time. So you, you know, kind of have some idea of what we're talking about. Because we're not, you know, reading the whole thing. Uh, we're not going to go through it verse by verse. But if you kind of read ahead, you know what uh, you know what the whole thing's about. And we'll just cover. We just kind of hit the main topics. But the main topic of this one is the faithfulness of God. Yes. God is faithful to keep His promise, no matter how many years. Abraham and I'll kind of give it away a little bit. But Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years from the time that we are that is recorded anyway that God gave him the first gave him the promise as Abraham was 75 and when he finally had his son he was 100 years old and uh, I'm sure like I say that Abraham got kind of anxious during that time but God God's time is is perfect it sure is you know as our as pastor Messer used to say God's always on time. He, 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 uh, often, he often misses chances Not to be early, early but, <laughs> but he's never late. He's never late. <laughs> so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, oh, Lord. We thank, thank you, Jesus. Lord. 
that when you speak it, yes. when you said it, Lord, when it, those words come out Thank your you, mouth, Father. we can go to the bank on it. We can count yes. on it, Lord. You are faithful to keep your word. Yes, you and so we don't have to worry about things when, when you've spoken, you, spoken the word. And then we just need to just trust in you. And no, Lord, that it's going to happen. Just yes. as you promised Abraham, Lord, yes. that you're going to give him a, a son out of Sarai, Father. Even though they had, they had to wait a number of years, Lord, it came about and you did produce a great nation, yes. Lord, out of, out of him, Lord. And you've given us many promises yes, that, of things that you're going to do through us, Lord, because of what Jesus did on the cross. And so we just put our trust in those promises, Lord, and and just help us not to, to waver in our faith, but to be strong and unwavering, Lord, and trusting in you and all that we do. Father, we give you praise and thanks in the wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, join us again okay. next week, and we'll go through the next couple of chapters and uh, find out the exciting end of this story. <laughs>